That animal that we saw was intelligent enough to work out that the best way to get away from us was a couple of hundred meters away, it was a hedge and he was going over it. I just froze. <laughs> didn't want to move because I didn't want it coming towards me or anything, something like that. You think, where the hell has that come from? Welcome to Big Cat Conversations. We speak directly to people who've encountered one of Britain's big cats. We also discuss the bigger picture. I'm Rick Minter, and thanks for joining me. Hello and welcome to episode 93 of Big Cat Conversations. For this edition, we are hearing about various events over the years, mainly in Oxfordshire in Mid-South England, but we'll also touch on Exmoor, a bit further southwest as well. Our guest is Steve Archibald, and he's an experienced and long-term investigator who lives in Oxfordshire and knows much about its big cat history, and he's been involved in much of it himself. Steve, thanks so much for coming on the show, and welcome. Hi, Rick. Thanks for coming on, Steve. I know we've been scheduling this, had a couple of false alarms, and we were going to meet in a cafe, the Black Cat Cafe in Northleach at one time, because it was right on the border of Gloucestershire and Oxfordshire. That would have been nice. That's right, yeah. We'll link people to the Black Cat Cafe. It's a lovely little place and deserves support in Northleach, in the heart of the Cotswolds. So it's nice to speak to my neighbour at last. Yeah, brilliant. And I don't know, Steve, what actually brought you to the subject. Was it your first sighting back in Devon? Is that what got you into it? Yeah, so um, back in 1990, I was part of a team of guys working, building roads and planting trees on newly built roads. So we planted the trees between Tiverton and South Moulton on the A361 North Devon Link Road. And they just built the road and built the banks up, and then we planted 800,000 trees along there on the banks for sound deadening and to make it look nice. So we were there for about eight months. Right. I was on that road the other day when I went up to give a talk in Barnstable. Well, well, there you are. I can tell you exactly where it was now because it was 32 years ago. As you come out of Tiverton, you go over a bridge which has got white water on it. It's a river axe. And you carry on 100 or 200 metres more and there's a bridge that goes over you and there's a hedge bank. If you're going towards Barnstable, it would be on your left-hand side. And it was the other side of that hedge bank. We were parked up. There's a lay-by just shortly after that as well, about half a mile along. Our stuff was in there, and we were working on that side of the thing. And we were strimming. So we were all in a line, about six of us in a line with these strimmers, goggles on, all the gear on, and vroom, 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 going along strimming. And I was at the end of the line, at the lowest point on the bank. It was a, a quite a steep bank going down, and I was down the bottom. We're going away and we're all in the line sort of 10 feet apart maybe. And this thing stood up in the grass in front of me and I didn't know what it was. It was about 10 yards or something in front. It sort of stood up and I didn't know, and because I had uh, goggles on and stuff full of muck, and it just went. And I lifted my goggles up and I just saw the back end of it go. And I thought, crikey, what was that? I don't know, what was that? And I turned around to the boys and no one else had seen it. They were just head down, vum, 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 streaming, you know. It was quite an intensive job. You had to work fast. So so I thought, no, we went sat in the van later on. I said, did anybody see that thing? And I didn't know what it was. I had no idea what it was. I knew it wasn't a fox. I knew it wasn't a dog. Didn't know what it was. So anyway, we moved accommodations along the road to suit where we were working on the thing. So we ended up in Molland when we stayed at the, the Black Cock caravan site. Yeah, a bit further northwest up that road. Just by South Moulton there, just by, there's a little service station there, South Moulton service station, just as you come down the hill. Yeah. And uh, we were in there just stocking up on, we'd stop the van on the way home to get some bits and bobs and maybe fill the van up with fuel or whatever. So I'm in there and I see this book on the counter and it was Nigel Briley's book, They Stalk by Night. Which is an excellent book, highly recommended. Uh, I still read it now even sometimes, it's amazing. He was a lovely, lovely man. So I said to the guy behind the thing, what's that scent? And he said, oh, that's, uh, we have people see this piece of x and we see cats around here. And I thought, well, maybe that was what I saw. So anyway, I said, OK, I'll have a look at it. He said, the guy who wrote it lives just up there. And he pointed towards the hill. And if you know where Nigel lived, you, you, you'll know where, where I'm on about. So he just pointed up, up the hill. Yes, I went to visit him once. Yeah. 
So then um, I read the book, was absolutely fascinated by it, and the lads would be ripping into me for it. So anyway, we were in the pub that night, in the Black Cock pub, and it was a very busy pub. Thursday nights was Skittles night, and it was quite busy, and we'd sometimes stay behind for a late drink. And there'd be a lot of locals there, farmers and this and that. So we're having a drink. We've probably had quite a few drinks. So I say, what's this beast of X more than? Is it like a Loch Ness Monster? And have you seen um, American Wealth in London when the pub just goes from, goes quiet? It all went a bit like that. Well, it just, everybody stopped and, and the bloke by the bar said, no, mate, it's a bit more serious than that. So and I was interested in it and we found that there was sightings in Oxfordshire, but Going back to Nigel's book, Nigel became a, f- a friend in later years, and we used to go, and Chris and I, my mate who I do the research with down in Devon, any time we were down there, we'd nip round for a cup of tea and that, and he was so generous with his time and with his knowledge, and he put us onto people and local farmers and local landowners and everything like that. He was a really, really generous man, and he really holds a, quite a legacy in the British Big Cat research, I think. I agree. He's a very scholarly chap, wasn't he? Very thorough. Real good guy. Yeah, he tried little experiments, didn't he? thought about a trap, and he thought about using growing cat... Well, he did grow catnip. Yeah, he did, yeah, yeah. Disappointing we didn't make more progress during his lifetime, really, because I think he is a founding father of the subject, really. Absolutely, definitely, yeah. Just quickly, Steve, go back to that one then. You conclude, do you, and as a glimpse, uh, as much as it was, uh, that it was most likely a lynx, do you think? Yes, absolutely, yeah. When looking at the pictures in, in Nigel's book then, we were sat and I said, that's what it was. Anyway, these lads were just ripping into me for it, you know. So anyway, that was that. And I was absolutely convinced about it, you know. So then we started hearing about sightings in Oxfordshire between Woodstock and Chipping Norton, that area, all over that area. Every village around there was getting sightings. So um, I got I used to go and speak to people there, and I knew a few lads I just went, went to play football with and stuff over that way, and I'd sort of talk to them. They'd say, well, someone saw something, but it, it was never really highlighted, you know. It would be in the paper and stuff like that, but, but then newspapers aren't the best at uh, accurately recording things. They stick nasty pictures of cats snarling on the front and stuff, don't they? So... That was that, but I got got to know a, a few people, and I know knew of people who had kept cats in Oxfordshire, and definitely one guy released his one. We know that. What type of cat was that? Uh, that was a puma, I think. Yeah. So then, in about two thousand, I really sort of got serious, and I changed jobs. I had a bit more time to myself. I could organise. My job takes me all over the county every day. I could be in a different part of the county and speak to people and ask people about it. So I got to know people. I got to know a few farmers. and They really helped me out, farmers. Now, even now, I still give them a ring this time of year because we're coming up to spring and lambing and that. I'll give them a ring and just to keep me in the picture and keep me in mind if they have any any um, kills and stuff. I always pop back to, to Exmoor whenever any chance I had. I always would, would always go down there. Um, it's a nice part of the world to be in anyway, a nice bit of walking and just a bit of headspace. And especially if you had Nigel basically opening the doors to you with landowners trusting you because Nigel had backed you. Yeah, Nigel trusted us. He knew we were serious, you know, we were fascinated by it, you know. Doing it responsibly. Yeah, absolutely. Yeah, that's really important to me. I sometimes keep people at arm's length if I don't, if I don't think they are. We'll get back to Exmoor a bit later if we cover Oxfordshire, yeah. because you've had two sightings in Oxfordshire in all these times. Yes. So, yeah, the first one I had was um, 2004, I think, somewhere around there. And I was having lunch. By habit, I sort of try and plan my have my lunch somewhere, but I can sit somewhere nice. Boys got binoculars in the van, and I could just sit and look out, you know. Mm-hmm. So I was sat one day doing that, doing just that, and a couple of fields away. So I'm sort of near, I'm just outside Oxford now, just not far from the A34, but near a train track. There's a train track going out of Oxford there. About two fields away, I can see there's all these birds, and I thought it was deer. Reach down, get my binoculars out of the case, and I put them up to my face, and I just saw the back end of a puma. But I think it was two pumas. But anyway, it was definitely one. And that was completely because of the bird commotion, was it? Yeah, they were swamping him, yeah. Mobbing? Yeah, mobbing. Yeah, I'd already spoken to the guy who owned the farm before anyway, just because there'd been sightings there in that village and around that village for 
for years before. But it's one village away. Well, it, the road I was on connects the two villages, and one the other village at the end of the end of the road is where the village where the guy that let it go. Okay. Roughly, when did he let it go? Do you think? Can't tell you exactly, but it was sort of end of nineties. Uh, Fairly recently. It wasn't a 1970s release. No, not one of them ones, no, no. That one about seeing the crows or the birds mobbing the cat and allowing you to see it. Now, that happens quite a lot in nature, that bigger you know, foxes and cats and predators get mobbed by birds. And there are some witness reports where people like you, have noticed the bird commotion first and then thought, hang on, what's going on there? Expecting to see a fox or something, and it turns out to be a big cat. But it doesn't happen that often, in my view. So it's nice that you had that one. That's what took my eye to it, yeah. Yeah, because otherwise you wouldn't have noticed that, that an animal at that distance, presumably. No, not really, no. There was, I wasn't even looking, well, I was just sort of looking out in a, in a daydream, you know. Did you get a good view of, of that cat? Yeah, I saw the sort of hindquarters of it. The tail was perfect, like a weighted end and a, and a black tip. Since then, we can go on and talk about that later on. I've been to Colorado and worked with pumas, so I can tell a puma just at a glance. Yeah, we'll catch up on that in a minute, yeah. So you're sitting in your lunch break, looking over the landscape, hoping to see things. Just looking at anything, really. We've got the lovely kites here and uh, buzzards and you know all sorts of just lovely, nice stuff. And that's what caught my eye. So that was happening. I couldn't believe it. I was so chuffed. I used to go on Radio Oxford regularly and speak to a guy called Bill Heiner. He, he died a couple of years ago. He's a lovely guy. He gave me a lot of time on his phone in radio program. He's the guy that had the shark, put the shark in his roof in Oxford, famous Oxford landmark. Yeah, well, we can put a link to that on the uh, website, perhaps. Yeah. Yeah, lovely guy. I used to do phone ins on there. We do an hour on that program. Loads of people, which I love, dissing it, saying no chances, none of this, no, no, you know. And I, I quite, I really, I really like that. I'm sort of a bit disappointed that it's come so popular now, if you know what I mean. I liked it when it was a bit underground and because at the end of the day, it's just a hobby for me anyway. It's just a hobby. Other people have said that, haven't they? They've said it's a good, positive thing to do in your spare time. But if you can contribute to the bigger picture, then that is a nice benefit in a way. Yeah. But it is a hobby, you know. That's why I have to enjoy it. Like other hobbies, you might be really into it at a certain point of time, and then a year later you might have weighed off a little bit, and then you'll go another spur to it again, if you know what I mean. So then the other sighting I had, which is a, couldn't be any better for me, really, because I was with a guy who didn't believe in big cats in Britain at all. So I um, I volunteer for Lowland Rescue Oxfordshire. So we, we search for vulnerable missing people in Oxfordshire. And we also um, assist the Thames Valley Police and the um, Oxfordshire Fire and Rescue Service as well in water rescue and things like that. And you use search dogs with you for that as well, do you? Yeah, we have everything. We have dogs, drones, boats, people on foot. So that teaches you a different set of alertness and tracking skills. Absolutely, yeah, yeah. There are courses you can go on for tracking. So it was early January. It was about minus three. At about six in the morning, Oxford Fire and Rescue Service were having industrial action and we had to cover them. So we had to be have a boat on the back of a trailer in our gear, ready to go. We keep our some of our vehicles and equipment on a farm in Oxfordshire in a big barn. So we were, barn door was wide open. We're sat in the cab of this truck with a boat attached to it. And this was about 2012. So we were, Sat in the thing, me and Pete, Peter, my friend, my colleague, and we were talking about, he was talking about dogs and his son was dog sitting and it, the dog had got out and killed his chickens next door and stuff. We were talking about animal behaviour and he said, oh, you're into these cats and that, aren't you? Because it had come up at uh, different um, meetings with the team. And I said, yeah, he said, that's a little rubbish, it's a little rubbish. So we were chatting and um, I was sort of justified how they might have got here, how they got here and... People have had them as pets, and where we, especially the area we were near, there was big houses and people might have done. So we were sat there in this van. We were looking out onto a very steep sloping field in front of us. It started sloping about 100 metres in front of us, and there was two small copses of trees. And we sat there, and this cat walked out, out of one copse and walked along to the other one. And this cat, I saw this cat walking along. I said, Pete, what's that? 
I can't tell you on the podcast what he said, <laughs> but he was very surprised. <laughs> but it was absolutely perfect. Right on cue after he'd scoffed. It's about 10 minutes after that, yes. Yeah, it was great. So, so that was it. He was in. And then 10 minutes after that, the farmer's wife came out with the black Labrador and walked up, not in the direction of this thing, but in another direction that we can still see. And we, and we said, right, how far away, wait till how far away that Labrador is until we think it was it. And is it the same size? And we both said it was the same size. Yeah. So it was a black one that you saw. Was it a black cat? A black one, yeah. But I don't think, I'm pretty sure, and we both said it wasn't the black leopard. Interesting. Why not? Just the way it moved. It, it was like a big black cat. Okay. It's the size that could kill a deer. Oh, yeah, yeah. No, it was big. I mean, it was, it, was ma- it was massive. It was big. Yeah, length of tail was what? About his body again. What was different then from the black leopard form in this one? Its movement and its, it's probably its, its head, actually. More of a, a rounded head. Not a panthera head, if you know what I mean. They're sort of rounded, but they do have a bit of a muzzle. Yeah. Is that what you mean? This one didn't have much of a muzzle. Is that what you're saying? Yeah, yeah. What I would say, Steve, is though, I'm in the camp that says they have diagnostic features, any cat in the species, but they'd have variable features and they're in a new niche and those variable features could adapt quickly in a new niche. So they aren't all going to look like the perfect one in a textbook. Yeah, yeah. I do accept that we shouldn't assume that all the black ones are black leopards, and we say this on the podcast yeah. sometimes. I think there are yeah. some quirks and unusual things that we... And that makes it more interesting, I think, as well, that we're discovering you know, something, uh, and it might be more than one thing, the black ones. Yeah. Anything else stand out about that black one, though, uh, in its form and movement and behaviour? It wasn't bothered by anything else. It wasn't intimidated by anything else. It was in a field next to cows. I mean, it was very early in the morning, so there wasn't much movement in the farm anyway, but it wasn't bothered by anything else. It went into this little copse. My van is about 50 yards away with all my binoculars and everything in it, but I'm in, the, I'm in this van because I'm on standby to go to a thing, so I couldn't, we couldn't go out and get out of the van and go. What sort of reaction did uh, Pete, your mate, this guy, have then? He was just absolutely, he just couldn't believe it. He couldn't believe it. It was perfect. It was absolutely perfect. Even now, you know, he's a good mate of mine. And um, he said, well, he said, I'm telling you, it was a big cat and it was there. We saw it and that was it, yeah. Was he chuffed and excited or was he disappointed you got one over him? He just absolutely couldn't believe it. Then he's asking, but how how, how did they get in a- I'll explain to him, and well, that was in an area on the way to the Chilterns. Of, it was in Oxfordshire, but there's been lots of sightings around there on an old airfield there. Okay. Did they encourage you even more on the subject, the fact you'd had two good sightings? Yeah. You were in the groove anyway, presumably. I was well in the groove by 2012, yeah. I've been doing it for 20 years or so. Going back to this phone-in show I used to do on Radio Oxford, we had a lady phone us up from uh, Bryce Norton and she had captured a cat in a big cage big dog cage yeah because her friend was a dog warden and they captured this cat this is after the fact this is years after the fact she's she's phoned in and told me this and uh, her and her husband it took both of them to lift it into the car they took it to a vet's in Oxford and then they phoned the week after they phoned the vets to see what happened to it and they denied all knowledge of it don't know what you're talking about She's straight up, I'm not going to say her name, but I've got to know her and I've spoken to her loads of times about it. Just to make sure, because I have spoke to people about it and Bill was writing a a book. We did a chapter on big cats in that, in Oxfordshire in that. So he was going to interview and I wanted to make 100% sure. I didn't want to sell sell him a wrong one, but no, absolutely. And so she described his cat. It had protruding canine teeth at the front, came out below its lip line. Even when it wasn't angry, she said it was very, very angry. <laughs> and it also had these white, she described it like um, on its hind legs, sort of haunches, it had very thick white hairs. She described it to me like a um, porcupine, white guard hairs. And that was that. And that was 
before I think the Bryce Norton, the famous Bryce Norton photograph was 2005, I think. We'll come on to that in a minute. Did she make any conclusions about what this cat was? She had no idea. I went round and I took pictures of all sorts, of up close pictures of black leopards that I'd taken and pumas and even jags and all sorts of things. But no, no, no. It was large enough to kill a deer, was it? Yeah, it was as big as a dog. I said, how big was a dog cage? So I said, well, dog cages only come sort of one for dog wardens. They're going for the biggest dog. It only just went in there, she said. And how did it get in in the first place? She put stuff in there. Her cat had been attacked. It was a big gash down its back. And she thought it was a dog or a badger. She didn't know what it was. They'd set this trap deliberately on their land. Yeah. To try and get the culprit. Yeah. Bryce Norman Village isn't very big either, so it's about only about a field away from the where the photograph was taken. Interesting. Yeah, we'll come on to that in, in a minute because that's a, a key event in the history of big cats in, in Britain for various reasons mm. because it's a good photo and there's a good backstory to it. But how interesting that she got that because a couple of people that I know have tried setting traps for big cats, and uh, including Nigel Briley, but somebody else as well, yeah, yeah. and have not been successful. And, of course, it's reckoned that it's very difficult to do wherever you are in the world, because if a cat's got a decent food source, it's not going to trust artificial... Something new. Yeah. Yeah, yeah. It has to weather in and you have to sort of camouflage it well when the smells and everything and use a a live bait like a a goat, a kid, you know, bleating kid. Yeah, I've heard of that, yeah. It'd be illegal to do here. I know. I've had had a guy say to me, if you get me a a thing and I'll, I'll do it, and I said, no, you can't do that. Can't do that. You'd need permission from a government agency to do that, if that bothers people. It might not bother some people. You meet people. a few people like that on this in this subject, don't you? Of course, yeah. How interesting. So they th- assume that the the vets turned it into a government department or the police or something and then played dumb after that. It's a vet I know well as well, so I've been in there and asked. No, they just don't, don't know, don't know just shows you how awkward people find the subject doesn't it especially if you're an official business or something and you're worried about reputation impacts and that sort of thing yeah yeah again it just shows you how difficult it is to bring primary evidence to the table doesn't it because people worry about the consequences and the comeback so they wimp out of it at the end of the day yeah a lot of wildlife experts and researchers and stuff not so much now but certainly in the early days when i do it they'd stay well away from the subject because they didn't want to be um connected with it have their status tarnished or whatever or show an interest yeah they might have a closet interest yeah no i think that still goes on yeah any other memorable reports on on that radio show that you had i got quite a few so there's a guy uh who was a night security guard at a very posh house in oxfordshire near chipping norton not too far from chipping norton and he'd seen a few things just when he's out at night with the torch it's in eyes and stuff eye shine and then one night he was driving in he had a van and he drove in and there on the right hand side of the driveway was a bank so this cat walked across it had a rabbit in its mouth walked across the road it didn't run it just walked and it went up and sat on the bank and he said he said if i open my window i could probably nearly touch it he said i can see its teeth and everything and I said, oh, that's brilliant. He said, no, I've got to walk around here at night. <laughs> he was terrified. But yes, that was a real belt. He said it, it was just there. What colour was that one? That was a black, all black. Yeah, yeah, yeah. And of course, a lot of these reports we're talking about now are in the days when people didn't have mobile phones, smartphones so much as they do now. Yeah, that's not too long ago. Not too long ago that everybody didn't have one, especially with a video or a decent camera on it. Yeah, some of these things may have revealed evidence if we'd have had cameras to hand at that time. Incidentally, going back to the one that that was mobbed by crows, your first puma in the distance, say you'd had binoculars that recorded or a mobile phone on you for that one, would you have got footage? I wouldn't have had time, I don't think. It was too far away and it all happened so quick, really. I had about five or six seconds. What about one when you were doing your search and rescue stuff? Yeah. That would have been great, no problem. With a zoom on it, yeah, absolutely, yeah. I, at the time, I had an iPhone anyway. It wasn't the latest one now, but it was 10 years ago. But yeah, it'd definitely be an image, and you could scale it and all that sort of stuff, yeah. 
I suppose the other thing to ask you while we're on Oxfordshire investigations is, regardless of the of the radio phone-ins, what is a sort of standout highlight of a report to you that somebody's had? Well, I've had a farmer on a quad bike just face-to-face with a black... He said there's a big black cat. He was on a quad bike and he said his head would have been up to the handlebars on the... Well, up to the front mudguard on the quad bike. And it was a he's kind of face-off on a country track. He didn't believe what he was seeing. And he just stopped there. And then this, this cat turned round and just walked, didn't run away, walked away. And he said, that, that's when I can tell you, it was definitely a male. <laughs> so... <laughs> Had he stopped or did it cross his path when he was driving? No, he was on a, on a path. It was on a path. He went around a corner. His farm edges onto a uh, RSPB site. So he actually farms on it. So he went around a corner and this cat was there. Yeah. And we disrupted you on the Radio Oxfordshire reports. Any other reports that stand out from that? Oh, lots. I mean, a guy phoned in one night and said he was in, a, in his car. He went round the round a, a country lane in a, in a little village, and this cat was there. And I said, "So, how long did you see it for? Was it like a couple of seconds?" Because we get this classic uh, sighting, don't we, of people in cars and the cat runs in front of them, you know, crosses the road, or you know, you might see the back end of it when it jumps over a hedge or something. So I said, "How long? What? A couple of seconds?" Or whatever. he said, "No, it was about five minutes. It just kept walking around the car. It was walking around the car. I, I didn't, I didn't know what to do." We had one in a lay-by in, in Gloucestershire like that to Frank Tunbridge. A guy made a long journey back, I think from an airport, from Heathrow or something, and he'd sort of had a quick stop in a lay-by near Birdlip Roundabout, actually. Yeah, yeah. By a wood which has sightings, got history of sightings, and he was just uh, turned off the engine and he had one come round. And that was about five minutes. He said it just circled round the car. From his description, you'd guess it was probably most likely melanistic leopard and it seemed curious and maybe the smell of uh, the fuel or something or the heat of the car intrigued it or whatever. But yeah. the people in those days did not have mobile phones. That was about year 2000 or so. And uh, these days, of course, even if you're scared, you might well get a chance. And even if it's at night in the dark with poor illumination, you you probably... Five minutes, you'd get your smartphone out in that time, wouldn't you, to film it? You'd have it. And everyone's got dash cams now. Well, I haven't. Well, yeah, I haven't got mine plugged in, so... <laughs> You'll kick yourself, Rick. You'll kick yourself, mate, when one... I know. When one sits in front of your car and you haven't got the dash cam plugged in. We bought one, we just haven't got it wired in. There you go. Yeah. So what happened in this case, on yours, your, this guy's one? That was it. He waited sort of five minutes or something. It went off and then he drove off. Amazing, isn't it? Yeah. And we had a guy who owns a small garden nursery. He um, opened up his barn door one morning, and what he thought was his dog went past him, but it wasn't his dog. He turned around and saw the back end of it. It wasn't. It was a a big cat. Yeah, what colour? Black. We get sort of 80 or 90% black, really. Yeah, so I was just going to ask you, what's your ratio like compared to the national picture? I reckon 80 or 90% black. I think I probably had four or five links, links like cats reported to me. All of these overlap each other, brown and black cats, the same territory, often even the same field or forest or copse or, yeah, yeah. Yeah, same as in Gloucestershire and same as other places. It is amazing, isn't it, how they seem to descend to the places that suit them and they must coexist sometimes and work around each other sometimes. Well, if you look, you know, certain areas of uh, Oxfordshire, you know, especially West Oxfordshire, if you look across, if you're at the top of the valley, you look across, I mean, a lot of it is, wood, there's, a lot of, there's a lot of farmland and fields and stuff, but there's a lot, of, a hell of a lot of woodland. The Witchwood Forest is massive, you know. That goes on for miles and miles, and they found um, dead deer up in trees there and all sorts of stuff in there. And, of course, you did have a very good active wildlife liaison officer from the Thames Valley Police who you used to link up with, didn't you? There's a couple, yeah. One was better than the other, but yeah, Ray Hamilton, a guy called Ray Hamilton, he really embraced me. He was interested in animals anyway. He'd really helped me out. He uh, he was out of Carterton, so any time I was over West Oxfordshire, I'd nip in, have a cup of tea, and we'd, we'd um, chew the fat and stuff like that. And he was a really nice, really, really helpful guy. He lived in Charlbury, and uh, he knew a lot of people who'd seen them as well, because he knew all the, a lot of farmers and rural 
gamekeepers and all that sort of stuff. So he was a good in. He got me in and uh, got me trusted and that lot. So I've had a lot of access to, to those sort of people. A guy um, was farming, a lovely guy. He's retired now, Jim Swain. He was in his um, in his combine, so he sat up really high. And they have the margins around the field, you know? Yes. For the wildlife and that. And he's twice he saw a big cat, big black cat. It didn't even, it didn't move. And, you know, he didn't, he didn't go right up to it, but he was near it. And it was exactly the same cops and... So we put cameras out there. And I always say to people sometimes, when I go there to put cameras out, I say, well, this will guarantee it won't come back because I'm sticking cameras in. But it's only got to walk around the other side of the tree and it's sort of hit and miss. And those were the days. It wasn't digital cameras then. You'd have to get the film out, send it off. Yes. You would only have 35 chances each one. Well, we'll hear about you on telly with Johnny Kingdom about that in a minute. But I think that kind of sighting in from a combine or from farm equipment, far, people working on farms as farmers or farm labourers, you know, I've had plenty of those. And of course, they're in elevated positions, aren't they? And they're they're going to create noise and disturbance, which could flush a cat out. So you do get those. And But I think those yeah. kinds of people tend to keep it to themselves more and don't blab about yeah. it. It's only because of my connections that I made that he was able to tell me about it and spill the beans. So you know, he knows I'm not going to tell the papers and there's not going to be idiots turning up at night with, with um, rifles and all that sort of stuff. It is absolute zoom. The whole, every um, letter or correspondence I have with, with any newspaper or anything like that or anything I put in bold things at the bottom is information is kept strictly confidential. That is my bottom line, really. And that's how... Um, Thames Valley Police have helped me out as well because they know I'm not going to go and blab about, you know, this and that. Or Yeah, well, it's great that you had that relationship with your local police um, force. Uh, in a way, it's a mutual thing, isn't it? Because you can actually have things delegated to them that they don't have the time Absolutely, yeah. To do, and you can keep them posted if you think there's any further issues for them to know. So I think that's a good relationship. That's exactly what happens, yeah, yeah. So the last one I had from them was... Early January, it was a pizza delivery guy at half past 12 at night. He was going into a village. A fox ran out in front of him. He slowed down, and then a big black cat was behind the fox, chasing the fox. Wow, yeah. I mean, that did we get reports like that? Yeah, does he know what the, what the outcome was? No, I mean, that was all he saw. He was on a motorbike on a road going along. It was just literally out of one little gap in a hedge into another gap in the hedge. That was this year, was it? January this year. Yeah, yeah, yeah. It was in the middle of the night, so yeah. It's an interesting to know to what extent that they do actively predate foxes or just have foxes in their sights when the opportunity arises because once you've got a bigger predator than a fox, it will regulate foxes' numbers. Fox populations yeah. will be saturated in landscapes where there are no big, big predators. And, of course, we are super saturated with foxes, so... If we reintroduce the lynx, it would certainly regulate fox numbers. But to what extent are these cats doing that now? And it's always it's interesting when there are witness reports of foxes being yeah. pursued, which we've had one on a very good one on this podcast, but also fox carcasses as well, which seem to be filleted out, really predated by something yeah. bigger and more awesome. In terms of attitudes, what kind of attitudes towards the cats do you get to hear and perceive from farmers and landowners and the police and other people? The farmers that I know and deal with are quite protective of them. They're not interested in shooting them. And these are sheep farms as well. They don't lose sheep. To, they maybe they lost one, lose one or two. I had a, a couple of years ago, a guy phoned me. He's a friend of another farm, a friend of mine. And he, he said, we've got a, a lamb here. And I described, I said, has it got a leg missing and an ear missing? And I'd already described to him what he looked like before he told me, you know. Yeah, yeah. I mean, Nigel Briley's book does that, doesn't it? That's very helpful yeah. guidance on carcass impacts and that. Yeah, I went and had a look at had puncture wounds in its throat, and it was classic, really. And he's not bothered in shooting them. He's not. He said it's not a religion to stuff anyway. It's not. It's not like they're killing fifty. We used to stay there. Chris and I used to stay on that farm as well. There when we went down, so it was brilliant. Yeah, we'd chat to them about it, you know. 
Obviously, there are exceptions and we can't speak for all farmers and some farmers with different attitudes may not be the types who would network with us and trust us to chat to. But That's right. you know, it's a surprising number of farmers and landowners are incredibly responsible and thoughtful about this and say exactly what you're saying, that they are more tolerant, fascinated and, and respectful of these animals. And that's partly because the animals themselves seem to be behaving themselves. But That's right, yeah. It's a constant surprise, I think, to people, isn't it? That, that that's. I think it's because it's not planned. It's all this sort of random event that's happened and yeah. farmers just find that it's interesting and the cats are not causing real problems amongst their, their, the landscape that they farm. Yeah. Often with other animals like foxes or whatever. I mean, I go to um, my family are Irish, so I go to Ireland a lot and I've been in Wicklow and that, and I stay on a farm and I don't tell him what I see on this farm or what I see sometimes. You just go and kill it. Got wild goats and that up in the forest above that I go walking and that. I said to my aunt, oh, I saw wild goats. She said, oh, don't tell, uh, don't tell Colin, he'll shoot them. <laughs> but fair play, he's got livestock and that, and you know that's it. This is what's his living, isn't it? And he's a, he's a good man anyway. But yeah, yeah. But of course, things don't always snaffle the livestock. That's the thing, isn't it? Exactly, exactly. Yeah. So another farmer, he's a, a pheasant farmer, or well, rears pheasants anyway, but on a mass on a big scale. This is years ago. This is probably uh, 2000, something like 99, 2000, somewhere around there. His son was driving up the, the thing into their, to their farm, long driveway, alongside all the pens, and a big black cat walked across in front of his vehicle, but it had a collar on. It had a collar on. And it ties in with the area, really. It could be, I could put two and two together. I won't tell you on the podcast, but I could, it, it, it ties in with other stuff around that area so it was in a cat flap situation where it was in captivity but let out basically is that right i'm not sure but there's there was lots of private collections around that area okay was that a black panther black leopard type one big black cat yeah he described it as that i didn't speak to myself that was often my uh another farmer friend of mine yeah but that was definitely out in the wild as it were yeah walked across the road in front of the car yeah 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 i've had a few with um, collars on, reported. Yeah, which does suggest that they're either very freshly out or they're being let out in a cat flap and the people are feeding them and, and yeah. are confident that they will come back or they're guarding animals, that sort of thing. Or, or it's just a house cat and people are mistaken. Oh, I see what you mean. OK, well, we'll get on to misidentification in a minute. Yeah. yeah. I understand that. Yeah, fair enough. That has to be uh, in there, yeah. Yeah, well, we can do misidentification now if you'd like, because that's queued it up. Because our word of the week, I was asking you earlier on today on text, and you said, well, have we done misidentification? And I thought, no, that is a good one. It is a curse and an occupational hazard for us all, isn't it? Absolutely. I always think about 80, 90% of the reports are credible, but it's annoying when you get called out to something and it's obvious misidentification. So you've had some like that, have you? Yeah. I've had one, Thames Valley Police phoned me and said, there's a lady that thinks she's seen a tiger out of the back window. They're still on the phone to me, and I've got the thing up on the map, and there's no woodland around there. It's like an open field in the back of the thing. And I said, are you sure? And I said, well, is she happy for you to give me the name and her name and number? So I phoned the lady, and um, she said, yeah, it was a tiger out of the back of the house. And I said, you and this lady was Indian, right? So I'm thinking, that's a tiger then. So I phoned the police back and said, well, I'm going to go down there anyway. I don't think it is, but because, you know, it wouldn't be. So I go down there. It's a big house back into fields. It was in um, Iver near Staines. So I've travelled all that way. So this is now closer to London, out of Oxfordshire. It's near um, Staines, yeah, yeah. But it's Thames Valley Police. Oh, yeah, yeah. So... Um, I go down there and I said, was there anywhere we can look out into the field? She said, well, I saw it from the back bedroom. So we go upstairs and I've got binoculars and all that. And I look out and there's a big, I mean, it is big, but it's a ginger tom. She says, there it is, there it is, there, there. (laughs) And I said, oh, I said, look, it's got a collar on, look. So that was that. But there's been a few like that. How did she feel when you made her realise it was just a house cat? I saw took it easy i said no it's okay that's not a that's just a big cat it's not a it's not a tiger but it was it was a massive ginger tom 
Yeah, but it wasted half of your day. It wasted half of my day and half a tank of fuel and, uh, yeah, all that. Yeah, I mean, luckily, the, I think ones that are that ridiculous are relatively rare, but, I mean, some of the things you see filmed for newspaper reports, you know, don't help the cause. Yeah, I've had photographs sent to me that, that I just put a ring around the uh, the collar and send it back. But, yeah, the classic, which has cost me, it must be thousands in time and, and fuel and all the rest of it, is the Charby Station cutout. Now, I had this reported to me on Saturday, so that it actually prompted me to add it to our list. And so this is just along from the station. It's in somebody's back garden, isn't it? Yeah, it's an art installation, yeah. It's a cutout, a metal, metal cutout. It's quite a good one, but between the train track and it is some um, hazel trees, so they're quite long and thin. And I think that the train moving and it, it might give a, it gives a optical illusion that the cat's moving. Yes, a bit like a Zoe trope. Absolutely, yeah. So I get people. I mean, for years I had these people. For, it would happen all the time. So I'm thinking, right, I'm working over that way. I'll knit there for lunch. And I'll just sit there because, and I'm thinking, this cat must be so comfy. Cause it's in the middle of the day. He, she or he must be so uh, comfortable in that area. <laughs> it's more almost right by the thing. I'm thinking, you know. It's, I'm going to get or get a thing in it. So for years, I'd go there at least once or twice a month or more. In the evening, sometimes I'd just go and sit there. Or, you know, I can't tell you. Loads and loads and loads and loads, right? People on trains, I'm looking at it now. I'd say, right, I'm going over. And that's that. So I'll, this guy phone anyway. This must be call number 50 odd. So, and he said, I'll tell you what, I'll come down tomorrow. I'll meet you. You tell your time and I'll show you exactly where it was. So I thought, great. I'll put a camera there. You know, at least I know exactly where it is. I can look for sign and all that sort of thing. So we get there. We meet in the car park, and he says, "Yeah, come down here." So we jump over a fence. We probably should, that we shouldn't probably shouldn't have jumped over, and we went down this thing under a bridge. And he was in front of me, and I just saw him stop and going, "Oh no!" I said, "What?" And he said, "Look." And I looked. Oh God, I could see it, and I, I was so. <laughs> it was funny, but. I was gutted and I was a bit angry because, you know, all this time and money I'd spent going over, time mm-hmm. is money, time and all that. But, you know, you got to see the funny side of it. I wanted to go and paint it pink. I never got around to it. But, uh, yeah, I even still get signs of it now. But it's quite a good one. I sent you a picture tonight for your book. Thank you, yes. And and I'm going to link it on the uh, podcast website because it's a very good newspaper article which explains it and has a nice photo of it. So- and it's still there in good nick because it's a, a yeah. steel flat sort of silhouette sculpture prop. And it was actually put up by a guy who was a builder, but he'd seen two. And so he got this permission to put it up in these people's yeah. garden that backs onto the train because he thought a lot of people would see it then. So it, it was actually inspired by real sightings in the general area. Yeah, Charby was a real, real hotspot in the sort of 90s and up to sort of 2008. Charby and the, the villages around there. Yes, and it is a very, very good sculpture, isn't it? It's got the high shoulder blades, it's got the, the extended long body, and it's got sweeping black tail. Yeah. The portion and the scale is just right, and the, obviously the situation. People describe it. It's, it was stalking something. I actually saw it stalking something. That is interesting about the, the sort of Zoe trope effect, that where you have these lines across the image making it look like it's, it's moving. I, I did wonder yeah. why people felt that. I could see on a moving train you might see the object that you're leaving behind is moving. Loads of people have said to me, I've actually, it was moving, I saw it moving. But yeah, I've seen it loads of times now, and that is if you're daydreaming half looking out the window and not looking for it, it does get that effect, yeah. Now, the lady reported to me on Saturday, I got back to her and sent her the link straight away to the article to show her what she'd seen. And she was very embarrassed. But I said, don't worry, it's interesting that it's still there. You've reminded me yeah, to, exactly, yeah. you know, you don't, you have to make friends with people who've been fooled and because and, they might become good allies in the future and shows they've got an interest. And I am surprised, Steve, that it took you that long. I didn't know that you had years or... How long did you go before you knew what it was then? Oh, five years more than that. Really? Gosh. Yeah, long, long time. Long, long time, yeah. Yeah, and the police still get it reported, I gather, as well. Yeah, yeah, yeah. It's part of the tradition and history of Big Cat reporting in Britain now, isn't it? The child breed. It's all part uh, of it, isn't it? 
prop, yeah. Any more misidentifications or your conclusions on what number of sightings and reports are mistakes? I can't, I couldn't put a number on it, but I've had lots of photographs uh, sent to me that you can plainly see aren't just from scale and which is fair enough but it's when you actually go out and uh, put a bit of time into it making putting scale to it yourself that it gets a bit frustrating but i mean but like you said we like people to report anyway if it is or not because it gives them an interest in it and it might be they might be the one that gets the a great shot of it for you and another time you know so it helps you out in some way i think you've got to see everybody as uh, as interested and absolutely yeah support everybody well i think misidentification is part of the subject we all know that it's uh, frustrating, but yeah, it happens. And I think basically also scaling can be very, very difficult sometimes That because the perspective and uh, sometimes yeah. they end up being really 50-50, I think. And, or sometimes then a small one, smaller than a black leopard, an adult black leopard, can still have a very interesting form and be long-bodied and sleek and look like yeah. a mini, mini panther. But you don't, you think, well, hang on, that isn't a black domestic cat, but it's not big enough to be a panther. So, and it, you know, what is it? So I think there are lots of ones that we don't quite know in between sizes that are tricky as well. In my experience as well, I've learned that some leopards aren't that big either. They're not massive Labrador-sized ones, you know, I would probably work with 20 leopards when on the place in Colorado that I was at. Five were melanistic, and they look, in daylight, you'd uh, mention brown. You wouldn't just say black because of the markings in them. But some of them w- would only be um, 16 inches at the, sh- at the shoulder. Other ones, there was a lovely one there called Jade, who was really friendly, and I used to go and sit against the wire, in her, and she'd sit against me on the other side, leaning against me. And Yeah, she wasn't massive. The place I worked at was a rescue place, and some cats were rescued from like being tied up outside garages and fuel stations and stuff like that, and just ill treated. And uh, she was, but she was lovely. She was um, friendly. And a mountain lion called Clyde, he was very friendly. I could go in with him, hand feed him. I mean, they are lesser cats anyway, but how cat like they are, they purr and meow just like a big house cat. A feeless cat that is really like a panthera in, in so many yeah. ways, but because of the scale. And so tell us about how you got that gig. That was in Colorado near Denver, was it? Yeah, it was near Colorado Springs. I wanted to uh, be able to tell a cat at a glance what a print look, a pug mark looked like, what scat looked like, just at a glance, so I knew so I know what I was looking for, you know. I wrote to a few people. I could have gone to Florida, to Big Cat Rescue in Florida, the one that's been in there, it was in, made famous. A couple of years ago on that. Carol Baskin set up, basically. Yeah, yeah. So this is 2008 I went there, May 2008 to Colorado. So I went there for a month. And there's 120 big cats there. Little cats from Vegas, a lot of tigers, a lot of white tigers, lots of lions from MGM. When they get so big, they just get rid of them, you know. One of my cats that I looked after, it was one of Mike Tyson's tigers called Kenya. I'd go and sit with her in the afternoons a lot. She was lovely. Lots of mountain lions as well. So Clyde, the one that was very, I was very friendly with, he was one of my cats that I looked after. He was bought just for um, as a present for a guy's girlfriend. And then six months later, when he was getting too big and bumping about, they, they got rid of him. Well, at the time, in 2008, they showed me advertisements. You could buy a tiger cub for $500. And you'd go meet someone in a Walmart car park they give you the cat, they count the money, and off they go. They wouldn't worry about any... It was disgusting, you know. This is all reinforcing what we've been hearing about the last few years from America, isn't it, about how shady and leaky the whole system is for owning yeah, yeah. Uh, exotic cats, especially tigers, but others, and, and cub petting and, um, and the yeah. money, the, the racket of money from all of this. How did they get their funding for this centre? It was all by... Um donations and fundraising events and stuff like that. I just lived at this place with a guy, his wife and the kids and another guy who was helping running it. What did you learn, Steve? It must have been so valuable. Yeah, it was the noises definitely at night. It was a massive place anyway, so lions would be over one end of the, of the uh, thing, tigers would be on the other, you know, and then the lesser cats would be over another side. We had servals there as well and bobcats 
But yeah, the, the noises at night was amazing. I shine as well. If you've got a cat in your torch, absolutely no mistake in what it is. It's absolute ping, bright, bright green coming at you. And much bigger, very big and forward looking. And Yeah, there's not going to be any question about it, really, if you know what it is. What it is. And also, just how stealthy they are, even in broad daylight, I'd walk up to Clyde's thing and go, Clyde? And then he'd just pop his head out from behind, uh, and his whole body would be in like nothing like a bit of wood, no wider than a telegraph pole, not even as wide as a telegraph pole. But uh, Clyde, and he'd just pop his head around and then come running at me. But he'd been stalking me since I was walking up, you know? They're so bendy and flexible, aren't they, with that flexible spine? He could see me, but I couldn't see him. Now, I was up close, and I knew he was in there, and I still couldn't see him. So even if you're out doing your thing, and you don't know how far away it will, and especially the jade, the leopard. She had a big wooden square thing she'd sit on sometimes, but I'd, I'd go up there sometimes, and she'd be behind it, but her head was back, so just, you know, almost like a crocodile underwater. Her eyes would be just above that line of that bit of wood, so she could see me. I had to look twice to see her. So they're so stealthy. I knew they were there, and at first glance, or, you know, I couldn't see them, no no chance. It just shows you how elusive they are, you know. How they observe carefully without giving themselves away. Yeah. And also um, body language as well. Being around any kind of cat, body language is really important. You can't go down on... Because um, some of the cats we used to go in with to clean and stuff like that. But you have to make sure there's nothing you're going to fall over. There's there's two of you in there anyway. But there's nothing you're going to... There's not a hose on the floor you're going to fall. Because as soon as you're on four limbs or bent down, they're on you. It's like a game to them, but they're playing. They'll, they could do you some serious damage. They'll be right on you. As soon as you look like prey or anything like that. So we used to do an experiment, like a massive tiger. who would be at one end of the pen, and I'd be outside the pen, but I'd sit with my back to the thing, and I wouldn't hear him. He's massive, and I'd know he was coming. I wouldn't hear him till he hit the fence behind me. So he'd be stalking me, and boom. But they were, I mean, they're huge, but so light on their feet, and, yeah, just amazing. What sort of things were good for enrichment in your experience in that situation for them? The place was absolutely huge. So they'd build, whatever arrived, they'd build the pen to suit them. So if three tigers arrived from the same place, they'd be in together. That pen would be built for them. So they had plenty of room. I can't tell you how big this place was. It was absolutely huge. Bigger than Blenheim Palace and the grounds of Blenheim Palace. It was massive. Having said that, sometimes it's not so much about scale, is it? You can have a smaller size for them, but if it's got good enrichment, it's about design as well, isn't it? Yeah, I mean, the pens will be built to accommodate whatever, whatever came with it, and they'd be big enough, and there'd be toys in there, and we'd go, depending on what cats, because some of the cats didn't want you to go anywhere near them or they were near you, so they'd have places they could go and chill out of the sight and be out of the way. And other cats would want to be with you all the time or near you all the time, you know. It's a case-by-case case what they'd make what they'd do for them. Some of the cats you'd bring out, we had a lion cub. He was 18 months old, I suppose. So it's about as big as a Rottweiler, a big Rottweiler. We'd feed in the mornings and then do other lot of jobs in the afternoons. And he'd just come around and sit with us. We'd sit and chill. It was amazing. And like at night, we'd have barbecues and I'd say, oh, should we let the cubs out? Yeah, come on. It was just brilliant. Yeah, was, I can't tell you. It was amazing. I cried when I left there. It was an amazing place. And really nice people, real nice people. Yeah, yeah. And I always think about how similar, in some ways, pumas and leopards are in scale and form. What would you say distinctions are, though, from, from working with both leopards and pumas? What differences are there? You have to be very careful with leopards. They're so... Explosive, if they need to be. Explosive and power. The power is something else, you know. They're so powerful. Like an uncoiled spring? Yeah. Yeah. Aren't pumas, mountain lions the same, really, but not just quite, the such quite force? They, they probably are if they're angry, but they seemed a bit more um, cuddly and chilled, and maybe it's because of the fearless characteristic in them, I suppose. You sort of relate that right to that more. I know you can't learn everything from captivity because not everything maybe translates to the wild, but individuals will differ a lot, won't they? Absolutely. So much. So much, yeah. Like I said, some of the cats would want to be with you or near you all the time. Others won't even want to see you, you know. They might have had such a bad time 
somewhere along the line they don't want anything to uh, to do with you you know and other ones they, they crave it they'd be up calling you the like clive he'd, he'd call out for me meow, 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 meow. yeah and that's the same with any animal i suppose isn't it? i suppose they've all got characters and good stuff so nice we've heard about that how often then have you seen scat in your investigations in britain that you think has looked like what you experienced in sweeping up and clearing up in colorado since then in certain parts of exmoor definitely seen things and in, in oxfordshire as well probably six times i suppose between the two of them even with scrapings and stuff like that on exmoor yeah like a scent scrape you mean yeah, yeah. One beautiful uh, paw print pug mark uh, in a driveway in on a farm shop. I can say now because it's closed. It was years ago near Chipping Norton. Just as you go into Chipping Norton, there's a farm shop there. And a veg man living at five o'clock in the morning saw a cat jump over one fence and over another fence. So they phoned me and I went out and I found on the driveway, I found a couple of prints there. They were great. On scat, how would you define classic leopard or puma scat segmented and full of bones and hair and and do you notice a smell to it so the ones i because we when we're over there we fed them on horse cattle and goat so there would be hair in it oh, i'll tell you a funny story so we had a guy phoned up one day and larry answered the phone he put it on loud speak he said hello he said this guy i won't do an accent he said i've got a goat for you it's 300 pounds, 300 pounds in weight. I need to get rid of it. And Larry said, how long has it been dead for? He said, it's not dead, it's alive. He said, oh, we only take dead livestock. And he said, yeah, hang on a second. <laughs> he goes, yeah, come and get him. <laughs> oh, dear, we shouldn't laugh, should we? But there Terrible. we go. No, but it was, yeah, funny, yeah. That was funny. So the scat in the park would have lots of hair in it and segmented, dark, Dark because it was meaty, presumably. Yeah, exactly. Yeah, because of the blood and that. Yeah, and then um, a kind of uh, I can't describe. Maybe a licoricey smell. Nothing like a dog or any other animal that, I, that I've worked with. You know, there's this issue about leopards in the terms of being a mammal's inherent smell are pretty odourless. Whereas, say, a fox has got an, an odour. If you're near a fox, you can often tell that. What would you say about leopard's odour? I've sometimes heard people say, oh, it's slightly nutty-like. To be honest, that place absolutely stank of cat's urine in and around it. And you've probably been peed on in the morning when you're doing your rounds anyway. Lions and tigers, that's all they really do, back onto you and pin. You're overwhelmed with the scent of their urine, so you can't really smell the mammals themselves. No, everything else gets cancelled out. Yeah, fair enough, yeah. Well, we'd better get back to Oxfordshire, and let's do the, the Phil Bucks photo, Mason Arms Pub. Yeah. So I tell you what my uh, knowledge of that one, because... Um, yeah, you crack on it, yeah. Yeah, OK, so this is a, a really excellent photograph taken in 2005, which went into the national papers, just the one, and it could pass as a cut-out prop like the Childbury Panther, only I believe it is true and legit but that is the problem with just having a photo of one side on because yeah. somebody could say oh well it's a taxidermist stuff one prop you know just put in the field and you can't prove it because there's no movement but i was actually showing it at a talk once and i was getting ready to start the talk and phil buck the guy who took it actually turned up out of the audience near the front row and said oh introduced himself and and i said you took that picture he said yeah by the mason arms i said can you get up for five minutes and explain about it in the talk and people absolutely loved it when he took over yeah, for a bit yeah. and he basically said and you may know this steve he said when it uh, turned up near bryce norton he actually had time to go home it was only two minutes around the corner and get a better camera because he thought and the guy with him thought that it was so unwild and unstealthy at that time that it had just been let out for some reason or got out somehow. And it was a recent one that hadn't really gone stealthy and melted away, maybe a recently dumped one. But they were obviously wary of it, but it didn't seem scared of them, but didn't seem interested in them. So he says that it shouldn't have been that easy to photograph, but it was, and he got that photograph. And he then said, 
One of the tabloids, I can't remember which one, actually snaffled the, the original photo off him and didn't pay him anything. And the next few days, it was all over the press. And, you know, he's just he's just inexperienced in dealing with the media and they snaffled yeah, the yeah. photo off him. We'll put that one on the website so people can see it. And it is, But it is a great one. And then it went on to the wall of the pub, didn't it? They kept it quiet for a while because they thought it'd be easy to shoot because it was so bumbling, as it were. But when it had left the vicinity, they put the photo in the pub. Yeah, that's right. Mason's Arms. The Mason's Arms, yeah, yeah. Yeah, so that's my take on it. Is there anything else you know about it? Not about that specific uh, incident, but that road between um, the A40 and Bryce itself, I've probably had 10 signs along there. From lorry drivers, coach drivers, sat in the farm entrances or something like that. And quite a few along there, all black, yeah, all black. Didn't around that time also the um, Cotswold Wildlife Park issue a a sort of challenge and issue a a reward for photos, really classic photos of big cats? Was that right? Well, what they did was they had a spare enclosure. They're really good at PR, Cotswold Wildlife Park. They're really, really good at it. They're very switched on. So what they did was they said they give a five grand reward and they'll keep it in the wildlife park if anyone could capture it. That was it. But over the years, like on the, um, there have been uh, shooting magazines that, that have, or publications that have offered bounties for big cat carcasses. I did a debate on a radio program with the guy from, the, I think it was actually Shooting Magazine, the editor from that about it. I know some of those guys sometimes, and I have to say, not all of them are pro shooting ones. Yeah. Uh, just because um, you know they come from that sector doesn't mean to say they all want to shoot them. No, absolutely not. No, no. But the magazine did definitely offer a bounty. That's right. Yeah. And London Zoo had an arrangement with Quentin Rose that they were going to take in anything that the late Quentin Rose could trap as well. But of course, it would be very good uh, publicity and profile for a zoo to have a wild cat in Britain. Yeah the big cat behind bars, as it were. And obviously it would crush the spirit of the animal that was captured. But, having, yeah. you know, they would, it would be very interesting to learn from and observe. I've got very mixed feelings about it, but it may be that we catch a one by accident one day rather than design. Yeah, yeah. Well, I wouldn't be trying anyway. Now, in terms of bodies, I once had one reported, I think it was a retired senior police officer, was driving on the Oxford Ring Road and he was in a traffic jam and he and his wife looked out the window in the central reservation and they said that there was an intact carcass of a mountain lion, the Puma Conqueror. And I think he phoned Nigel Spencer. Nigel Spencer didn't know you. He's the guy in Leicestershire we've had on the podcast. He passed it on to me because he knew I was local and I passed it on to you because you were even more local. And you tell us what you do because I know you made great efforts to try and follow that up. I lived in the village right next to it, so it was between Balls Hill Junction and the uh, Botley Interchange along there. Pinksy, actually. Yeah, I got the old high vis on, and I walked the whole centre of reservation. That's it. I spent time on it and did it. But that is a very busy bit, and it does get very, very gnarled up. And I just can't see how nobody else reported it. Well, maybe people did see it, but didn't report it because people tend to sort of not take responsibility for much yeah. in life, don't they? And Or assume somebody else is going to and it's not a priority. But, I mean, this guy, I spoke to him on the phone. He was a retired senior police officer and he said, there's bound to be an outfit of people who are interested in this. And it was a dead big cat and I wanted to report it. So it got into relevant hands. It's really good of him. He was totally legit. Yeah, yeah. But I did that. I spent an hour or two all along there, both sides of the road and in the middle. That was pretty dangerous to do so, wasn't it? Yeah, it was, yeah, but, you know, I thought I was going to get the find a body of a mountain lion. Yeah, the incentive was high. Stupid enough to do I had a high vis on and I wasn't jumping in front of cars or anything like that, you know. From my um, tree planting days down in Devon and all over the south of England, I was used to busy roads, working next to busy roads and stuff, so I was a bit careful. You put a call out on Radio Oxfordshire as well, didn't you? Yeah, Radio Oxford, BBC Radio Oxford and all that. But no, I didn't get anything. I, I phoned uh, Thames Valley Police. They hadn't heard anything. Yeah, all avenues, everything came up with a nothing, I'm afraid. And other ones evaded us. Exactly, yeah. It's all part of it, isn't it? Yeah. And the conspiracy theories can 
go whichever direction they want on that, but uh, it is frustrating. Before we close off, could we quickly go back to... um, Johnny Kingdom? Johnny Kingdom, yeah, go back to Exmoor and your your meeting with Johnny Kingdom. I bumped into him in Exmoor once. He was a larger-than-life character, wasn't he? A super guy, I thought, and did a very interesting programme about the wildlife and the deer and the rural sort of crafts of Exmoor because he was very much a people's man and a former grave digger and a avuncular figure and he was into big cats and you met him while he was doing the TV series didn't you you and Chris Johnson and you did the big cat five minutes as part of a series is that right? Yeah that's right they called us down they wanted to, to be consultants on the program about big cats and birds so we went down for the weekend I'd met Johnny before we went to some local places we we both knew, really, and we put the, the cameras out. You put your faith in people when you're doing these TV things. Wasn't what sure to do it, but we after chatting to the producers and stuff, we did it anyway. We put the cameras out, and then we, in, like in the old days when you have to get them developed and stuff, so we put them in to be developed, and we got deer on it. I mean, it's just when you put them out for one night, I think it was just to get the shots of the... So it would be nothing like you would do in your normal research, you wouldn't just go put a camera out one night and then go and get it the next day, you know. They wanted us to do quite a lot of stuff that we said, no, we wouldn't do. They wanted us to do to find things and stuff. And we said, we're not doing anything that's not real, you know. Johnny was very funny, acting up in front of the camera. He was crawling around like a big cat and stuff in front of the camera to get a scale and stuff. But yeah, he was a lovely bloke, real nice guy. Yeah, larger than life and really animated and passionate, wasn't he? Yeah, absolute legend. And he genuinely was interested in big cats, wasn't he? Yeah, he was. He was a good connection as well. So after that, we'd go down and he'd put us on to people. We knew a lot of the people that we'd already met anyway. So, uh, yeah, he was interested in all of it, really. He'd take us to some places and uh, we'd be, we have to remind him, we're looking for cats, Johnny. And he'd go, yeah, but look at those deer in a minute. They'll be up. He said, the sun's going down. They'll be on that in a minute and all that. Yeah, it was brilliant. Deer was his passion, wasn't it? And of course, he died tragically, didn't he? Yeah, he did, bless him, yeah. He showed us some special places that we still go back to now, you know, that other people off the beaten track that other people probably wouldn't go to. Very nice, yeah. Well, I think that there is a segment available still that we can link to the website of you and Chris with Johnny doing that. Yeah, there's a YouTube somewhere, I think. We'll link it onto the website for this programme. People can see you in action as a as a younger kid on the block <laughs> yeah, yeah, absolutely. pursuing the subject. Yeah, brilliant. How would you compare Exmoor with Oxfordshire on the topic? Oxfordshire is, is okay. I can get on to lots and lots of land that I can I, I want to. Exmoor is just wild and you could end up in the back of beyond and, and on a wild goose chase, really. It's a bit more open, a bit more hit and miss, unless you know specifically areas you want to go to. Whereas Oxfordshire now, it's changed so much in the time I've been doing it. The place before was Chipping Norton all around there, within a sort of 10-mile radius around there. And it's very gone very, very quiet over that side of the county now. So it's more sort of South Oxfordshire now. But it is about having contacts, isn't it, I think? It's all about that. It's all about legwork, contacts, meeting people, being a people person, really, because that's how you get in. And... People knowing you're doing it responsibly for the right reasons and you're not going to sort of go crazy if you get anything that's important. Yeah. You can't be a good introduction from someone, you know, if, if you know, like Nigel introduces to people and also my farmer friends here introduce me to people. Can't beat that. Do you get frustrated? I mean, you've been at this a long time, like me, Steve. Do you get frustrated that we've made such real, relative little progress in revealing the evidence over the years or do you think that's just part of it it is very challenging we haven't got many resources we are really just playing at it and and they are very stealthy animals does it frustrate you or do you just think well that's that's the reality of it it doesn't frustrate me i enjoy doing it what worries me is that when there is more clear evidence and there is i don't think it's doing the cats any favors yeah i think that depends on how we handle it yeah, it's, but it's not how we handle it, because we can handle it however we want to, but it's how other people handle it. And the messages put across in the media, you know, they'll just put a picture of a snarling cat on the front of a newspaper. It has to be a sensational story. 
they don't give a toss what happens to the cat after it. They'll put a picture of a big cat snarling. The only reason the big cat's snarling in the photograph is because it's there for a photograph and there's someone poking it with a stick so it snarls and they've taken a photograph. In our what we do, I think we have quite a responsibility to the cats and to, um, in a way, to the public as well, but especially to the cats, because I, I only do this because of the cats, really. I love it because of the cats. It's my hobby. But I think overexposure, I don't think that will do the cats any favours in time. Yeah, because they're not a beast on the loose. Well, I don't think we've got the, the money or the time to generate the PR behind it that you would need to make it a positive story. Just the media calling them beasts anyway. I mean, that's a negative thing. I, just one thing that absolutely does my head in. Maybe the slow acclimatisation of it all is for the benefit of the cats and us in the terms of buffering the culture shock of it all as well. Yeah, but you know as well as I do the media work, it'll be a sensational story. What I would say is that I do think below the headlines now, in the content of the text of the stories, the tabloids are getting better if we feed them the right thing, but they just cannot resist the chilling, hyped-up headline. They just feel it's got to be scary and edgy to draw people in, and then they'll say better things, more progressive stuff these days. But, yeah, the headline's still got to be over the top, unfortunately. Absolutely, yeah. Yeah, and how do you feel? So, in a way, you're basically now saying that you are quite protectionist about the cats but so what's your yeah. attitude to them naturalizing what's your emotional response to big cats being in britain steve i love it i think it's fantastic i don't think there's any negatives from it as long as they're left alone you know if somebody it goes and shoots one and doesn't kill it then we've got then we'll have real problems you know i think they definitely got a role to play we've got far too uh, many deer we need to clean up the pheasants after the shoots have had them and plenty of rabbits around now and stuff so yeah no bring it on as long as they're fit and healthy and they're not uh, they're able to they, they'll hunt what they want to hunt and that's probably deer isn't it good stuff well thank you ever so much for taking us all across these many different topics You've covered a great deal of ground i'll probably put the phone down now and, and think ah oh, i didn't tell him that <laughs> it often happens i can tell you so prepare to be frustrated but keep in touch steve and um yeah Thanks ever so much for all of this. Great you could be on the show at last. Thanks ever so much for being on Big Cat Conversations. My pleasure, Rick. Cheers. OK, as we close out, we're going to return to Exmoor briefly because we have a poem which is based on the area. It's one of the contributions we had last autumn, and we're grateful to Andrew Robertson for this one. For those of you who don't know Exmoor, place names in the poem are Drew Stone, and that was a big cat hotspot back in the 1980s, and we heard about that area with Eric Lay in episode 31. And then Andrew mentions the Baal, which is a wonderful wild river, which deceptively funnels through the central parts of the moors. So here we go with Andrew's poem. It's titled Elusive. I heard the scream again last night, far off. It was getting dimpsy as I crept along the coombe. In silence, I watched and waited by the stream, but saw nothing but flitting bats in the gathering gloom. What was it that I'd heard? I thought I knew. Johnny heard one years back in Drewstone Fields one night. And Trevor? He said he'd actually seen one, a coat of pure black, gleaming in the sun as it took flight. People scoff, of course. Show me some proof, they say. All I can offer is anecdotal. Hares caught in a barbed wire fence. Flummox farmers and suspicious footprints. Me? I've seen nothing. Probably never will. I've got no real evidence. Perhaps I'm foolish to believe. But... I heard the whispers again last night, by the fire in the blue ball bar. Dick has had another you taken, picked neatly clean. Just like the others, the third this month. And I know, I know there's nothing else it could have been. I know they creep silently down these deep lanes, lie patiently in wait for unsuspecting deer, in the shelter of moorland hedgebanks, haunt the barl, and spooked the close-wool sheep. They are here. I heard the scream again last night. Far off. 
Many thanks, Andrew, for capturing the essence of Exmoor and the mystique of the whole subject. And thanks for reacquainting us with Dimpsey, which we mentioned in episode one of the podcasts. It's a southwest term for dusk or twilight. And the Blue Ball pub Andrew mentions is a historic coaching inn dating from the 13th century. It's on the mid-north edge of the moors. And back in episode 72 with our guest Craig, we heard about a farmer's big cat meeting there in that pub. Now, just a couple of queries to relay from podcast listeners, because we sometimes link people up by email so that you can have a chance to collaborate and know of each other's interest in a location. Well, we have different people in South Wales and in Northamptonshire who are currently looking to do more investigations and to follow up reports. So if there's anyone out there in South Wales and in or close to Northamptonshire on the case and keen to meet fellow travellers on this subject, do feel free to email me and we can possibly make some link-ups and introductions. And of course, as you know, anyone who's had a sighting or encounter who would like to be on the show is welcome to get in touch. The email is on the Big Cat Conversations website if you ever need it, and it is rick at bigcatconversations.com. Righto, coming up next time... Well, we've just talked about the media treatment of British Big Cats with Steve just now. And right on cue, we will be talking with a journalist who has a keen interest in the topic. So that's coming our way in episode 94. OK, we're signing off now. So thanks again to Steve, our guest. And thank you, everyone, for listening and supporting the show. Look forward to being back soon. Take care and bye for now. <laughs>